All right, I'm going to start the painting using only primary colors of yellow, red, and blue. That quick glimpse of a picture was um, a painting I had done in watercolor in 1977, and I'm using that as my guide. And uh, I'm doing a voiceover here, so I'm likely to be behind a little bit. So let's see. This video is also done uh, in double speed, so you don't have to sit through an hour and a half of, of my painting. And I've, I've cut out the boring part, so I hope this is satisfactory. Um, someone please remind me to remove the uh, misting bottle next time so that we don't do this uh, half-hour portrait of a uh, misting bottle. All right, so I've, I've using the various uh, mixes of yellow, red, and blue to make browns and, and warm, warm grays and cool grays and so forth. And I just wander through and making um, these, these trunk shapes. Um, this looks like a half inch or three eighths inch flat brush. In this arsenal of brushes, I think I have a large, uh, maybe a one inch filbert and this little, this little uh, detail round brush. And then I'm using probably, I believe it was a quarter inch flat and maybe a three eighths inch flat altogether. And so I just go back and forth. Oh, I think I'm pointing out the center of interest or something here. It's, it's a little bit of a trick to remember what I'm talking about when I, when I point to various things in the painting. So, like I said, I'm recording this audio after the, uh, after the uh, painting. The idea behind this painting was to make these trees, some of them make some of them dark and make some of them light as if it was a slightly misty or foggy day in winter. And so we have these light shapes and then we have these dark shapes and, and obviously the darker uh, trees are meant to represent trunks that are closer to the viewer and the, the light shapes are meant to um, look like they're further away. Now here I remember I put in that's really a bit of a strong blue, so I'm probably going to go back and hit it with orange later or something to counterbalance that. Because these are just, even though these colors are a little wild, you know, you don't want to get too unnatural. Unless, of course, you're going to do a, a psychedelic painting, which is probably going to be the next version of this that I'll do for fun. Uh, this is representing where you paint one tree behind another to give distance. In this case, the, the tree I just put in should be light and the one in front of it should be dark. And I'm sure I probably change that later. And I see I just went back and uh, put some warm green on that and orange on that um, that blue trunk to, uh, there you go, that's some warm color to make it look a little bit more believable. So I'm, I'm going to take a break here. I'm not going to talk through this whole mess. And I'll, I'll add some audio as it gets a little bit more interesting. And we're adding um, some warm color here. Uh, here we're dark, starting to darken up the trunks to make them appear to be uh, a little bit closer. And as I go through, and I might have my colors be a little off, as I've said before, I'll go through and uh, and change them a little bit. I, what am I pointing at? I don't know. Please, someone tell me. All right, let's, what's this, more trunks. You can see that some, I try to make some of the trees lean. There goes a good leaner. And uh, there's another. And while I think about it, I'm, I'm working on a large piece of 100% cotton rag mat board. This is the thick eight ply board. It's a half sheet. I think that makes it uh, 20 by 40 inches, something like that. And uh, I really like working on this this 100% rag 
board. It's a very smooth board and um, it, it absorbs the color nicely. It will last way past my lifetime. And um, what I have done, and this is similar to uh, the, the Crescent watercolor board or, or uh, any of the other illustrations board that illustration boards that are for water based media. And I like to use this because if you're familiar with doing watercolors at all, uh, and, you, and you paint on um, uh, watercolor paper, you know that if you don't tape it and do all sorts of things to it, it will ripple and drive you crazy and the, and the colors will, will flow into the crevices and, and flow off of the hills and it will just make you nuts. So I like to use the illustration board. And in this case, uh, you can see that I've drawn a line. I've taken a, a rule and measured this out very carefully. And I've given myself, I think, a four inch border on the bottom, three and a half inch border on the top and sides. And obviously I'm painting outside of those lines. The reason I do that is uh, then I, I can just cut a three and a half top and sides and a four inch or so bottom mat board and just lay it over this and then put a backing behind it. And then of course some plexiglass and a frame and I don't have to tape it in. I don't have to glue it. It's the same size as the mat board, and it, it just gives me a nice way to keep everything nice and flat. Um, you can see around the edges, I, if I'm not sure what my color is, I test it. You may end up you know, seeing dozens of brush strokes around the edges of a painting before I'm done, because always test the color. If you're not sure, you don't, especially with watercolor and, and, and of course, acrylics, um, you, you want to know what color you're putting down. I mean, you can change it to a degree, but you know, if it's not quite right, you know, it, it just makes more work for yourself. So I usually, you'll see that I test around the margins sometimes. Let's see, it looks like I'm putting up some smaller trees, trying to create a sense of distance here. These smaller trees off, ah, I see they're going up the hill, they're off in the distance. Yeah, creating a, a little bit of a, a effect of depth. And I don't remember if I mentioned, but the idea behind this painting or this demonstration is um, using acrylics as if they're watercolors. Now, lots of people use acrylics. They're inexpensive. They're easy to use. They, they get the effect you want without all the um, uh, health scare and, and difficulty and smells of dealing with oil paints, which I'm used to, but some people don't like it. So a lot of people use acrylics. And with acrylics, you can, of course, paint on canvas. I don't particularly care to paint on canvas. I don't like the weave. I like a smooth surface. So with painting acrylics conventionally, I'll usually paint on primed masonite or some painting panel, which is like, a, I think it's called Danish plywood. It's a quarter inch thick, extremely smooth. You can buy them at, at your local art supply place or online. Uh, and of course you have to gesso it and sand it multiple times. But that's not what we're doing here. We're painting on illustration board with acrylics as if they're watercolors. If And so we water them down a great deal, probably about two-thirds water, one-third paint. And you know you have to adjust according to your own your own likes, how much how much color density you prefer. I don't mind going over things several times to build up color. I'd rather build it up than put it down too strongly and then, you know, have to lighten it up. So that's the way I do it. So anyway, uh, what we do is we water down acrylics and I put them in a, like a squeezer bottle, like, a, like an old ketchup bottle. Obviously, I'm not using a ketchup bottle, but, you know, it's a bottle with a nozzle. I put the paint in and, and the water and I shake it up quite a bit and you know it mixes nicely and I use these little plastic egg trays they work so well for um, for doing watercolor so and of course again we're not doing watercolor we're using acrylics for a watercolor effect you if you water down acrylics and try to do this on canvas and board it doesn't work so well it beats up but using an absorbent watercolor paper or oil illustration board or this rag board like I am using, it uh, works quite well. It does not beat up, it gets absorbed into the board. It creates a nice matte surface.
let's see, put a little texture in here. You know, using that little brush. And I'm not not trying to paint detail. I'm trying to paint um, what I'd call shorthand, you know, just textural brush strokes, trying to create the illusion of texture without painstakingly painting, you know, uh, every piece of bark along the trunk. So generally I, I paint a little uh, darker color on the trunks as I go down. Ah, here I'm strengthening up the uh, trunk now to make it appear closer. And here's another, yep, again, trying to create that feeling of depth. You, you've got, these are closer to you. The pale ones are further back in the, in the scene. So where are we? What am, I'm wandering around, okay. Uh, more darkness, okay. It's like I'm watching a movie. I'm fond of my drip, I know. There you go. It's covered up by the mat. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm very proud of it, as you can see. I think the next version I'm gonna do this is, I'm gonna use some psychedelic paint, because I, you know, I, after all, a child of the 60s, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, use less control, and I'm gonna actually try to do like a drip painting like this. That should be fun. All right, so I am mixing up yellow, and believe it or not, I'm gonna use that put a sky in and I'm testing my colors out as you can see I'm giving a speech to my students about God knows what probably explaining why I'm using yellow um, always someone will ask me why do I paint the sky in after I do all the work because it's so much more difficult yes I know I could just put a swatch of sky across there first and then paint all the trees in but we're working with transparent paint because just like watercolor, since the acrylic is very watered down, it's transparent. And if I painted a big yellow sky there, then every tree would have a, have a line of yellow that would show in every single tree and you wouldn't be able to get rid of it. It's just, you have to get used to working with transparent color if you're used to working with um, gouache or, or, um, or oils. And, it's quite different. Transparent color, you have to, you know, everything is going to show. You have to pay attention to what you're, what you're doing in the layers. So that is why I, I paint the sky in last. And, uh, and here I am, obviously, still explaining away. Where? Come on, let's paint here. Wiley, what are you doing? Okay, here we go. Putting in the sky, and I painstakingly pull the paint in between, back and forth, in between. Um, each of the trucks. So the idea behind using this color is I'm trying to create a, a warmer, um, a warmer palette, even though it's a winter painting. So many people paint winter paintings and they use um, primarily blues and purples and grays, and it's very cool. It's very muted. It's very quiet. And over the years, I've learned. Um, possibly because you know in talking to to buyers of my prints and such that um, people really appreciate a little warm color in a winter scene once in a while because not many artists do that so that is why I've started to do a little bit of a, a winter sunset theme um, over time using you know a little bit of a little bit of afternoon color in like that and you know, you can see that I just, it just, the snow, the winter, is just, I'm just leaving the paper in between, letting the viewer, letting the viewer's brain, you know, observe that it, obviously it's snow because either it's snow or the artist forgot to paint the grass in, I suppose. So yes, it's a winter scene. So here I go, painstakingly placing all my my yellow and uh, I'm probably trying to explain what am I explaining center of interest or something I'm trying to control the viewer that's what I'm doing so I'm going to dip down that's what I'm saying so I'll test my color yes so so I'm going to create this this um, horizon line as you can see I'm, I'm working about a third of the way down 
the two-thirds ground. And you see I'm starting to dip down. I'm starting to move my horizon line lower because I'm trying to control where the viewer's interest is going to be in the painting. There are so many tricks to um, making it easy for a person to know where to look. If you if you put all your your hot colors or your your little tricks in the corners, they're going to be wandering off looking at somebody else's painting. So I use a lot of tricks with color and, and line and, and shadow to control the viewer's interest within the painting so that they can experience the painting um, not only all at once but also they can wander through and see and pick up different things as they as they observe the painting and hopefully you know not just go oh look and then walk away but they'll be intrigued by the different colors and shapes and, and different things to look at. So continuing, yes, painstakingly. It doesn't take long. I don't remember if I mentioned before, but this, yeah, I think I did mention. This video, I'm, I'm running at twice the speed, so I can't paint this fast. Well, maybe I could, but I don't. I could if I had more coffee than I should, but... Uh, Again, I'm trying to, I don't want you to get bored because this originally was an hour and 45 minutes, I think it took me to paint this. And I whittled it down to an hour and 21 minutes and I thought, oh my goodness, that's, people are going to lose interest. So that's why I've got it at, at double speed. All right, you see how I'm pointing out how the, how the line dips there and you go, oh, look at that. And you, you have a little bit of a, something to look at there, something that catches your attention. Now. I am wondering what I'm talking about in the class and probably my next step. Let's see. Ah, yes. Make it a little pink. Look at all that water being added to the pink because I want this really thin. Mixing up with pink. Just pure red and water. There is no white paint in this process. It is just either yellow, red, blue, or some combination thereof, and water. So I don't know if after I put the yellow in, I decided it was too bright. I don't know. I think I probably knew I was going to do this. So let's see what I'm doing. I'm using the pink over the yellow to, to tint it towards an orange. And, um, you know, make it a little bit more subtle, a little bit warmer. Now, of course, you're all going to say, why didn't you just mix orange? And this is another little trick that I do. I think that it's especially um, good with using water-based paints. And that is, uh, you don't just want to mix a color and slap it down because all you'll have is that flat color. By doing it this way, you know, I, I go across and I, I paint all the yellow in. But when I come back with the pink and do the same thing, I'm covering all those areas. But I'm not covering every single square inch of it. I'm letting the yellow peek through. You know, I'm not being all that careful. I'm letting the yellow peek through around the around the edges and around the trunks. And, and what happens is you get this little flickering light effect. And, you know, sometimes you, you may be a little bit heavier with the color, sometimes a lighter. So what happens, you get a, you get a yellow, pink, orange subtlety in the, you get those colors in this particular case. You, You'd get whatever, you know, flickering color. I mean, if you use blue and purple, you'd, you'd get, you know, again, blue, purple, pink, and white. But it adds interest. It's not flat color. It adds intrigue. It adds interest. It adds something to look at. It adds something that makes you look, be interested. It's not just flat color. So that's the, why, that's the reason that I do this ridiculously painstaking uh, process. I encourage you to try it. You'll learn something. All right, so I'm just slowly working away, loading the brush, more pink. Here we go, making it nice. A nice warm afternoon walk in the woods by yourself. 
contemplating nature in the cold. But I don't feel cold when I look at this. If, if this was a, um, you know, a 100% winter scene with the blue and the purple, and you look at it, um, you do feel the cold. You know, and you feel that the snow's coming in any minute. It's going to crack and you're going to get snowed on, but you feel different. Your emotions, your reactions are different looking at a supposedly winter scene when you have these warm colors. I think it's a little bit more uplifting. Okay, what am I doing? I'm mixing blue. Oh, Lord only knows. Am I going to hit the sky again? Yes, I think I am. Yes, and you see the color's a little bit strong. So what I've done is I believe I'm mixing a little bit of green. I suppose I could have taken notes, but you know, it's just, I'm just painting on the fly and trying to remember to get, get us through it. Now I'm just wondering what I'm doing. Okay, mixing color. Obviously, I'm just blathering on to the class. Oh, texture. Okay. I thought I was going to mess with the sky some more. Okay, more texture. More darks, more texture. so we're continuing with the, the texture obviously I've used uh, blue and red and I think there's there's some yellow in there all those colors together make sort of a mucky earthy color you see texture 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 and that one looks starting to look like a birch tree oh why did I leave that squirt bottle there <laughs> it's like an ode to a mister bottle now oh, there we go. All right, now texture. I'm sticking my fingertips in the paint and just flinging it on. And you see that your palm is one of the most interesting, useful tools in in painting. It it spreads out the flickering or the, the splattered paint and it grays it down and it smooths it out and it adds interest. And here I go again, water, paint, God knows what's going on, I'm getting it everywhere, of course. This is a way of creating texture in nature paintings that you, um, you don't have to go in and paint every single grass blade and, and uh, every, every twig. This is just a way of giving you a background to work with. So I do this quite a lot, especially in watercolor. I do not do this when I'm using oil paints because, you know, I just can't get it off your hands. Oh, what am I talking about now? Let's see. What's next? Uh, again, texture. I'm just adding twigs, rocks, texture, whatever it is you want it to be. Building up on, on the, the splattering and the hand palm printing and so forth. Just adding texture. Yes, I'm painting upside down. I know that's that's an acquired skill. I don't expect you to know how to do that. But I do it that way so I don't block the camera. I'm always looking for the tricks. Okay, now I must be doing I'm doing like a sapling to I've choked up on the, the ferrule of the brush do detail I get in kind of detail but you'll notice usually 
you should note that or notice that I I generally hold the brush somewhere in the middle unless I'm doing really fine work because that keeps you from being too stiff and trying to concentrate too much in the detail. You know, you loosen up a little bit, you do better work. Okay, where are we? Do we ever go back to that sky? Yes, I think. Is that where I'm going now? Who knows? Okay, this is the big, it's like a one inch filbert and I'm just putting in some shadow color in the foreground. Once again, this is a little trick that diminishes the importance of the foreground. It takes the, yeah, here I'm explaining, it takes the viewer's interest away from the lower edge of the painting and it forces them to look up a little higher in the painting because, you, you know, you're naturally going to be inclined to look at the lighter colors and the brighter colors. So darkening the foreground takes, again, it, it diminishes the importance of it. It's another control mechanism in painting to to um, force the viewer, yep, yeah, that's what I'm showing you, to force the viewer to look up higher into the painting. If you look at, look at a lot of old master oil paintings, you'll note that in the foreground you may have people pulling wagons or tending their gardens or whatever, but they're almost always in extreme shadow. They, they're there, but they do not overtake the painting. They're like an afterthought. So that is the idea behind darkening this painting at the bottom. And uh, this reminds me, you know, when, when way back before cameras, someone might own a, a steamship line and they would have portraits painted of their, their steamships, I suppose, for advertising purposes. And you'd be a nice big white ship out there with a beautiful sky you know, and an ocean. And they would darken the upper and lower all four corners so that you'd end up with kind of a vignette which seen, you know, darken around the corners like an oval vignette which forces you to notice the boat. Diminishes all the other possibilities, you know, to distract your attention and uh, by observing those old paintings that's how I realized that that's what that was all about. So I use that frequently. What am I doing? Texture. Twigs, sticks, texture, yeah. Guess I should put those limbs on the tree sooner or later. And we've got about 10 minutes left here, so what am I talking about? I gotta darken that? Yes, I am. I'm going through and choosing which trees I think should be, should appear to be closer. And I'm gonna go through and strengthen up a lot of those trunks right now, it looks like. And here's one. Come on, is that the one? Yeah, there we go. Okay, let's Looks like I'm, at the same time I'm working on texture. I know a lot of painters work on one little area at a time. You can, as you can see, I'm everywhere at once. Go back and forth and back and forth. And I, I trust my instincts. I've painted many, many, many years and I've developed an ability to just paint without thinking. And you, you just learn to just go, get the paint out, get the board up, paint. And um, paint without hesitation. Where are those limbs? It's like a bunch of sticks without limbs. Come on, I know you you got some limbs in there. Come, uh, Oh, nope, I keep thinking I'm doing limbs. I'm still darkening trunks. Now, a lot of my classes feature landscape paintings. I mostly actually paint architecture. I love old buildings and, and such. But I find uh, in teaching, painting a landscape is the best way to go because you can just about make every mistake in the world and no one's going to know the difference. If you're painting buildings, people, animals, automobiles, 
stru rigid structures of any kind, you have to get the perspective and the details and the likeness correct. And it's just too difficult to teach that for me. Uh, I find that, uh, I mean, yes, I'm painting trees, but the techniques are the same for painting anything. It's just easier to learn this way. Learn how to work the colors and, and how to work the brush and, and how to draw. And, and those other things that I'm taking about take a great deal of, of more time to, to teach. And, you know, I think people would just get bored. And perhaps in the future I'll try to do some a perspective lesson or something. And we'll see how whether we can keep your attention or not. But again, you know, I want to say don't think of this as, as a landscape. Think about this as a lesson that you can use these techniques in. You know, you see, I rubbed that out with a finger. I didn't, I didn't like it. It was too dark. You know, I, I paint with my fingers a lot. But whatever you're painting, you, you know, just spend the time. You, if you could see this painting up close, you would note that a lot of these limbs don't even touch these trucks. I think I'm actually connecting them now. But as I go, I end up just doing a bunch of slash marks. And what happens is um, if you took the time to paint all of these and connect all the dots and make sure that every limb had a tree, a tree trunk to land on, it would look more amateurish. It's, it's really kind of a strange thing is that sometimes the more care you take to make everything exactly connect and a leaf has to be connected to a twig and a twig has to be connected to a, a limb and a limb has to be connected to a trunk it looks less professional when I find that when you just you know you fill in some of them you connect a lot of them but uh, a lot of what I'm doing especially right now I'm just putting dashes in there the viewers brain connects the dots the, the viewer simply sees that these are all part of those trees they don't necessarily know which one any particular dash or, or limb may belong to, but they know it's all part of the great, the great mass of, of chaos in the, in the canopy of the, of the treetops. All right, so I hope you've made it this far. It looks like we're down to just about five more minutes. I go on with quite a few bits of, of dashes. Just keep building up, building up. Fine, fine brush, little, I don't know, number two or number three round brush. And, and a word about brushes I've been using, I think this is actually a cheap sable. I have been using those um, white Tolling, I think they're called. They're white, synthetic white, soft bristles, short brushes with the little soft rubbery part in the middle of the handle, you know, because I teach seniors. And they really like those brushes. And I've learned to use them quite effectively. You, you know, I mean, we can't all buy $100 um, um, Kolinsky Red Sable brushes, you know, for watercolors, especially with acrylics, because you're going you're gonna to mess them up a little bit. And, and by the way, do not use these brushes for, for watercolor and acrylics because you will ruin them. All right, so winding down, what are we working on? I guess I don't do anything else to the sky. I must have dreamt it. So in, I think I'm just putting in more like short dots now. Again, just adding texture, adding interest. Texture, 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 back to the texture.
and then uh, we're near the end so once again I want to remind folks to no matter how terrible you think your painting is you are the worst judge of your work that there could possibly be just sign and date everything you do and in a few years you look back and you'll be amazed at the progress you have made so let's see I'm putting a few ghostly evergreen or, or conifer shapes back here as if there's some some growth back here you know just a little very slightly gray green you know because these are far away in the distance I don't want this color to be too strong well, I think I it was too strong so I pat it off with the palm of my my hand again I don't even realize how much I I use my hand and, and my fingers until I watch this video. It's again I do it without thinking. All right, well, you know, it looks like we're about there. So thank you very much for watching. And um, check out my other videos. You know, I do everything here from drawing, painting, color mixing. Um, psychology I'm afraid I I, uh, I wander on sometimes about you know things not necessarily related to painting but you know what to encourage you to paint and, and uh, yeah a little bit more on the evergreen darkening up a little bit okay bye for now